Welcome, my name is Dr. Caroline Heldman and I am the Senior Advisor to the Representation Project. Uh, the Rep Project is a nonprofit organization founded by the great Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Uh, we use films and campaigns to challenge harmful gender norms and stereotypes. And the interview today is our last interview uh, for the Boys Will Be Boys series of experts. Uh, Boys Will Be Boys means that they can be anything and everything they want to be without the constraints of restrictive masculinity. And our goal is to provide tools to boys, young men, uh, not young men, uh, teachers, coaches, parents, educators, uh, so that we can create these spaces where boys can be anything they want to be. Uh, this is really our love letter to boys and men. So I am delighted to be interviewing uh, Dr. Ingler Carlson today. Uh, Matt, I'm going to read his impressive bio and then we'll jump right in. Uh, Matt uh, Engler Carlson is a professor and department chair in counseling at California State University at Fullerton. He also directs the Center for Boys and Men. Yes, such a center exists. You should check out their website. Uh, his work focuses on healthy and pro-social forms of masculinities, healthy boyhood and education, and psychotherapy with boys and men. As a member of the American Psychological Association's Task Force for Boys in School, he is committed to educating parents and teachers about healthy boyhood. Uh, Dr. Engler Carlson is the co-creator of the Positive Psychology, Positive Masculinities model, or the PPPM model. No, the PPPM, which includes model, uh, which is the original framework for positive and healthy masculinities. It adopts a strengths-based approach to accentuate healthy masculinities and boys and men in school and community settings. Uh, Matt is also the core author of the APA guidelines for professional psychological practice with boys and men. He is the clinical advisor for the men's mental health app, Mental, and serves as Movember's Global Men's Health and serves on the November Global Men's Health Ad Advisory Committee and the advisory board for the Positive Masculinity Foundation. Yes, all websites you should be checking out, incredible resources. Um, as a clinician, um, he has worked with children, adults, and families in school, community, and university mental health settings. And he's also an engaged father to his three children, Jackson B and Gemma. Welcome, Matt. It's so good to see you. Thanks so much. That's a long intro. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's a long and impressive intro. You have been working on this for decades, and it's just incredible work. Um, and I'm sure by the end of this interview, folks will be going to Amazon or maybe a, a less uh, capital, you know, a smaller store and purchasing oh, yeah. all of your books. <laughs> um, let's jump right in. So tell us about your path to healthy masculinity and gender equity work. How did you get on this path? When did you know this was going to be your calling? Um, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And it's, it's funny. I, um, was doing a workshop this weekend with new grad students. Um, and we were talking a bit about how, you know, research is me search about how the ideas that we have in terms of why we do certain forms of scholarship and why we ask certain questions, you know, as opposed to this notion that we have value free science or that we should, you know, not involve our lives and the work. The reality is it's almost impossible not to do that. And so as part of that exercise, um, you know, I kind of recounted kind of my own story of how I came to this work. And I realized as I've thought about that question over the years, the, the answer always changes a little bit as I gain more in, insight into myself. And, and, I, and I think when I, when I think about that, I, I think about my childhood. I had two parents who had children when they were young. Um, and, you know, in a sense that my mom had, was in her last year in college and she dropped out because she was going to have a child. And then I came along a few years later. My dad at the time, who had been a horrible student, realized that he better get his act together because he had one child and soon he had two. And he went from um, someone who actually failed out of two universities to kind of someone who immediately began to get all A's and good grades, um, which is pretty impressive for someone who ended up eventually having two doctorate degrees, but um, but I always show my students his transcript like, you know, the past does not define the future. Um, but I bring that up because what what I was aware of is that I moved a lot as a child on top of that. So um, I was born in Michigan. I lived in Illinois. I moved to South Florida. And at the age of five, my, uh, my, my parents moved to Hawaii. Hmm. And so we moved around a lot and um, because of that, I went to a lot of different schools. Uh, and I lived in Hawaii for two years before finally moving to 
uh, Wisconsin, actually rural Wisconsin, um, when I, I when I was seven and a half. And so I ended up actually being in four different schools in four years. And what I was aware of, as of course, as being in Hawaii in particular, is that um, when I look at the photos back then, I was the only white child in the school. I was um, I was a towhead. I was a Howley. I had very white hair. I stood out in many ways. And um, and then, of course, when I went to Wisconsin, um, there were only white children in, in, in the schools for the most part in the areas where I lived. And um, and because of that, I think I became just attuned to my environment, honestly, like I began to be aware of kind of what was happening around me and how I was fitting in as all children have to do when they go to new schools. On top of that, my dad actually was brought to Hawaii to create all the child guidance programs for the state of, of Hawaii. So his job was to kind of go through K-12 schools. And at that point in the mid 70s is, is, is create guidance programs, which is, is a precursor to what we now call SEL. So um, in the 70s, maybe it's a product of the 70s of a certain form of enlightenment. There was idea that schools had a school counselor and the school counselor would come in and they would teach you about feelings and friendships and um, early stage wellness breathing exercises, meditation, like all of these kinds of things that um, that in my house was normal in the sense that like, honestly, my parents' friends, my dad's friends were people who created these programs and my myself and my sister were actually the test children for kind of kind of puppets and songs and materials that would then be used in in, in classrooms all over the world. And so um, so I think because of that, like there was an attunement that I kind of had at a pretty young age about my environment, about the fact that I had an inner world um, and that the inner world didn't always kind of, kind of match the outer world. And I think I also had a bit of attunement around my mom in the sense that she was certainly uh, identified as a feminist and, and an activist. And I remember going to like save the whales protests and rallies in the 70s. And, and as much as my dad would also say that he was a feminist too, I, I might beg to differ a little bit now, but um, he tried. And, um, but I think there were elements of activism in my, in my core family that again, um, I think what that did for me is it just gave me some awareness or I, I would say attunement. And I think as a young boy being in these settings, what I was aware of is that, you know, there were a lot of rules in terms of how I was supposed to kind of be. And that became really more apparent actually coming from Hawaii to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like expectations for what boys were supposed to do. Some of that's also very developmental at that age, right? Um, the, you know, boys played football at that boys liked, you know, boys like football and they liked kiss. And then, and I didn't know who kiss was. I didn't really know who any football teams were at the time, actually. And I didn't even know much about pop culture because most of the pop culture I knew actually was Japanese. Mm, right. um, but I conformed. So I look back at kind of, I look back at things I wrote in first and second grade and my favorite band is Kiss and my favorite team is Dallas Cowboys. And, <laughs> and I've never listened to Kiss and I definitely don't like the Dallas Cowboys. And so, um, but th there's ways in which I realized as I was trying to, to um, fit in and conform and I think that certainly fit in the masculinity kind of sphere, meaning that I knew at a young age, I was short and I was kind of scrappy, or so I was small. And I was always the smallest kid in my class up until actually probably mid high school. And um, what I learned of course, is that um, I'm not supposed to show tears, mm. I'm not supposed to cry. Um, so again, all these, what I'm not supposed to do, you know, so I wasn't supposed to do certain kinds of things but I also understood that these notions had a certain level of like plasticity to them. It's like I, I wasn't supposed to cry and yet I had tears in my eyes. Right. Um, so clearly I could cry and I, I was aware of that um, and I couldn't control it. So again, I, but I would mask it. So, you know, in sports, I, I wasn't hurt. I had sun in my eyes. Right. Yeah. Like I wasn't hurt. I've sand in my eyes and, and, I was aware at that age too, as long as I conformed to masculine norms of that time, you know, if I just said it was sand in my eyes and, and I wasn't screaming for my mom, the boys around me were accepting me and I could go on, on my way. Um, 
but I think that awareness, and I think when I entered into kind of junior high and began to like date or when dating was forced upon me, like um, I remember also being super confused about relationships and what did that look like. And I remember uh, having a friend of mine um, who sometimes we wouldn't at recess play games. Instead, we would just walk around the school in a circle and we would talk about like all of these feelings we're having, all this confusion we're having about dating and very innocent dating, like passing notes in class and things like that. But still, it was very confusing. And I realized, in a way, it was like early peer counseling. Mm -hmm. um, so I put those things out there because I think it's just an awareness I kind of had at this young age that, you know, again, the inner world and the outer world weren't always different and there were ramifications. Mm. If I fast forward, you know, I ended up kind of leaving Wisconsin. I went to UC Santa Cruz for my undergrad. Um, I got much more of a dose of actually feminism and kind of women, women's studies at that time. Um, very little understanding about masculinity or masculinities or men's studies or, or that was even a thing. Um, fast forward a few years later, I'm now a school counselor and I'm working in the San Francisco Bay Area at a K-12 school. I, I did a mother-daughter group at that time. Um, I was really excited about this. It was mid-90s and um, Reviving Ophelia had come out, um, kind of Mary Pfeiffer's kind of, kind of seminal work on the inner lives of adolescent girls and realizing we needed to do something. So we did this group for a year and a half for moms and their daughters. It was, again, maybe the best professional thing I've done in my life still. Mm -hmm. At that time, having questions from um, some parents and staff, okay, now what are you gonna do for boys and men? What are you gonna do for fathers and sons? And at the time, kind of saying, well, you know, I don't, I think they would show up anyway. You know, and what I was aware of is that, you know, honestly, 95% of my interactions with parents were, were not with dads. Dads were very infrequent kind of visitors to the school. Men in general were very in, 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 infrequent in the schools. Like we had a male PE teacher, principal, counselor, band teacher, math and science teacher, right? Um, but I was also aware of at the time that like my own understanding of kind of masculinities was pretty inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, so when I kind of move a little further ahead and I, I, I realize it's a long, there's a long, longer version of this story, but when I move into my, my doctoral program and I was at, I was at Penn State University and I was probably further along in my program without a dissertation topic. And my advisor at some point said to me, if you don't pick a topic, I'll pick it for you. <laughs> yep. and, and you're probably not going to like it. You know, and so she said, well, you know, why don't you look at your clinical work? And at that time I was working at a, at, a, at, a, at a university counseling center and I had a lot of male clients on my caseload. And I began to see some very common themes. One was that my clients were coming in in acute distress. Mm -hmm. I would ask questions about how, how long have you been experiencing depression? It wasn't, you know, weeks or months. It was often years or, or I can't remember a time when I haven't felt this way when I would say things like, um, and have you sought help before? No, you know, and I was aware that the acute distress often went with suicidal ideation and thoughts as well. Um, and many times actually post breakups and post kind of moments on like that in which they felt super, super alone. The second thing I was aware of was that my clients were staying in counseling. Meaning we had, we had a 12 session limit. My clients were going 12. And then they were continuing into a men's group. And so something was happening in therapy that they were pretty hot on and they were liking it. And on my end, I was thinking that I was aware of is that the, and the work wasn't that hard for me, meaning that working with men felt very natural and felt very normal. And it felt like the relationships I was crafting were a lot like the friendships I, I was able to craft with, with male and friends in my life too. So, um, I learned at that point, like, you know, that there's a field called a psychology of men and masculinity. I didn't know it even existed. I began to do some research. I got super hungry. Um, I read everything I could possibly read um, from across disciplines. So psych, counseling, sociology, anthropology, women's studies, gender studies, everything I could read, I exhausted in her library alone. And I just read and read and read and read because I, I was very interested in this. And, and I moved that into my um, 
beginning of my academic career, you know, um, and then a few years into that, I, I also began to have a bit of misgivings. Like I was aware of the fact that I was learning a lot. And as that knowledge base deepened, um, what I was aware is that I, what I only really knew about actually was what I would call the dark side of masculinity. I knew a lot about pain and, and distress, a lot about all the things that men were doing wrong in their life and all the impact it was having on themselves and others. And I knew very little about what I would call, call the light. And it seemed to me that the more I learned about the dark, the light was kind of being slowly eked out. Hmm. Um, and I was kind of always trying on these theories or articles I was reading and kind of wondering like, would this fit for me? Like, is this a definition, a total definition of who I am at, as a man? And I came to the conclusion that it wasn't actually, that there must had to be something that was missing here. Um, and so I began to think much more about kind of what are we also kind of helping men understand what they're going towards? Mm -hmm. You know, meaning that if, if, if psychotherapy is all remedial, psychotherapy is always going to be about telling me all the things that you've done wrong in your life, um, which is often how we start therapy, right? We, and for men, that's typically a shaming experience, you know, and you can almost see them hang their head low and say, let me tell you about all the things that have gone wrong. But I realized when I swapped that question and said things like, help me understand where you'd like to be as a man, I'd get a very different response. So I began to think much more what I would call strength-based kind of work, um, looking at kind of growth-oriented things, looking how we could build growth-oriented relationships. And that's kind of where kind of, I would say, positive masculinity kind of emerged, was this recognition around that, you know, yes, and it's not denial of problems, it's not denial of power and privilege, but it's also kind of a recognition that we know, for example, that having traditional masculine beliefs isn't necessarily unhealthy, right? We know the unhealthy bit comes in around when it's, when it's rigid beliefs that you can't kind of deviate from that kind of norm. And so the, the rigid belief is all that you kind of have. So how do we then teach men to understand that there's, there's a time when it's helpful to be stoic and there's a time when it's helpful to be emotionally expressive, that there's a time when courage is, is called for and there are times in which that is not what is called for, right? There are times in which there's value in actually being independent. And there's times in which what you really need is to reach out to a friend and offer help to other people. And so for me, kind of positive masculinity, which in my eyes have actually has evolved, I always call healthy masculinities. And of course the evolution of the Y to the IES, beginning to think more about intersectional masculinity has been like an amazing journey over the past almost 20 years um, to the point where Again, there seemed to be an element around continually thinking about like, and what are we not talking about? And I think in particular, you know, often thinking about kind of how do we think about boys and how do we think about what is healthy boyhood? Um, because again, uh, so much of the work that I've seen done that's really effective gender equity work happens in adulthood. Um, but it seems like we could do a lot better in boyhood. Well, um, let's, and, let's talk about that. Um, what advice, so what does healthy boy, boyhood look like, right? What, what would maybe a template or a blueprint be? And then what advice do you have for people who can shape this for boys, right? Parents, teachers, coaches, others who are working with, with boys and around what age, like, I'd love to know, I'm sure folks would love to know some specifics about what you're thinking. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I appreciate you, you, you jumping in there too, because it seems to be to me where my heart is now too, yeah. is thinking a lot more about, um, again, like how do you operationalize certain ideas so that people who want to help, whether it's, it's parents and teachers and coaches and administrators and, and community leaders have some ideas of what that actually kind of looks like. And, and part of me starts with kind of saying that anyone who wants to help has to do their own work. <laughs> Like we got to start with kind of unpacking our own mm -hmm. own gender biases, actually, because we know that actually gender bias is is the strongest implicit bias that we have. And so there's often this thing, right, which is like, you know, I, I talk about it sometimes with young boys. It's like you want to validate the feeling. So he's hurt. So you want to validate the feeling, but you're not sure if you do. 
because a part of you is worried about him being soft. And so you give like, you know, the kind of hug that's like a partial hug. You know, it's like a hug with a little bit of reservation. Yeah. You know, it's like, I love you and it's okay. And yet part of it's not okay. Um, and I think that happens naturally, right? Because we do have very kind of set ideas in terms of what is okay for boys and what's okay for adolescent and adolescents and men. So kind of doing your own work, I think is critical. The second thing I would say is um, work to understand the world of boys today. And what I mean by that is like, I'm aware that, you know, the world that my father experienced um, is not the world that I experienced. Yeah. And it's not the world that my 20 year old experienced either. You know, and essentially that masculinity is, are always changing as if, as it always has. Masculinity is, masculinity is not a static concept because gender isn't this, uh, a concept that always, and in fact, gender itself and gender roles and gender norms and gender expectations has probably been the greatest change in the past 50 years in our society, mm -hmm. right? And so beginning to think about kind of how the world of boys might be very different today, because I think we have a lot of boys telling us the world is different. Right. And we're not always the best listeners. <laughs> Because we're still stuck in some ways in terms of, wait, this is how it's supposed to be. This is how it was for me. And I think we have to kind of be very boy focused. Where are they right now, Dr. Angler Carls? Like, where are, are they? Talk to us about video games and porn and bullying and loneliness. Like, where, where are your boys and young men today? I think there, I mean, I think there's all of those things, right? I mean, I think that the world in a sense, in terms of the way that technology has shifted, is dramatic, right? And we we know, for example, if we talk about, you know, a big word today is like the adolescent mental health crisis, right? right? Talk about, we can actually look at data that says that like, that was already kind of moving in a certain direction. And then in, in 2012, it's, it took a dramatic spike. What happened in 2012? You got it, advent of, of the smartphone, yeah. right? And so that is for us too. Yeah. Like it's also the adults and, and so as, as um, children became more attracted to smartphones, right, we became more distracted from our children. Mm. Mm -hmm. right? And so again, I remember when my son, for example, started playing video games and I was like, oh, we shouldn't play video games because I had this idea that again, you should go out and play, right, in the neighborhood. And then I began to think about, wait a minute, like, if I was 10 and I had video games like this yep, and I could sit on my sofa and I could yep. talk to my friends too <laughs> and never leave the house, would I have left the house? No. So then I began to think like, okay, so what is the lesson here? Like, does my son, is he a bully? Is he being bullied? Is he misogynistic? Is he using inappropriate terms? Is he a, a good teammate, a good sport, a good kind of, kind of friend? Well, he is. Mm. So, so what is the issue? The issue is I wanted him to get some physical activity and get outside. I wanted, you know, some vitamin D. Um, so I began to negotiate with him around that less of kind of get off the video games and more like, let's plan a little bit of kind of outside time. And you can also play video games. Right. Um, but I'm also aware of course, of the way that video games impact the brain. Right. So I need to, you know, so I begin to share some knowledge around that too. So I think there's ways in which kind of thinking about how the world's kind of changed. So you said, where are boys today? Yeah. Um, in some ways, the most connected and, and disconnected group of people, like all of us, you know, there's some struggles around authenticity and what does it, it mean? If, if, you, if you can be anything, it's hard to figure out where you actually are sometimes too. Hmm. Right? And I think because there's so many shifting sands on, on identity, that a lot of boys need some guidance and spaces to talk about it with trusted people, right? Because, you know, you mentioned in the intro, like I've done some work with the app Mental, um, which, is, which is a tech company, and it's been pretty amazing to figure out how to, how to reach kind of populations that maybe aren't being reached. But I've also learned a lot about tech. And, you know, what I've learned is that the deck is stacked against you. <laughs> And, and that, you know, the algorithms are stacked against you and that it's hard to compete, right? And so I think that th this notion of having a compelling counter narrative to tech as well is really important for parents, which is, 
understanding what they were receiving, but understanding a lot of what happened in, in tech and information that boys receive is unfiltered, um, ex, unexperted, right? Yeah. There's lots of what we call, call bro science in the world, which is based on nothing, and except potentially kind of, you know, very antiquated beliefs about masculinity. Um, and so again, it's, be, you know, and again, I also think adults need to understand that world before we judge the world, right? Like pay attention to why there might be an attraction to certain kinds of things. Um, I, I might add too, I think actually the, one of the greatest gifts we can teach young boys is actually emotional regulation. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, a, it's the greatest gift that most humans, but particularly men could learn too, um, because I think we've done a very poor job in kind of understanding that a lot of the difficulties that boys experience in schools are, are the result of that, right? It's kind of understanding that the ways that boys understand emotional language at a young age, it's often, they're often socialized away from it. And then when we call on them to, to regulate, they don't necessarily have the same ability to compute what is happening, to name the emotion, and then to have an appropriate response, which is to un understand how to process, name it, or actually come down from that feeling. And so that's where like SEL work in schools is, is actually really helpful, right? But there has to be some space to understanding that that may not be, you know, at times when boys say they don't understand or don't know what they're doing, that maybe they really don't understand what they're being asked to do, you know, and because of that, because of that, like, again, to save face, a lot of boys will just exit the space, hmm. right? Um, and two other things I would just say in terms of like where boys are and what we can do is that uh, obviously we want to model what you want to see. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, and that has a lot to do with kind of uses of technology, but it also has to do with kind of how we talk to each other in general, like you model what you want your children to kind of see, what coaches as well, coaches don't get a free reign to be disrespectful, right? You know, they can be upset about things, but they can also model how to be upset in a respectful manner with people too. Um, and the final thing is like lots of patience and love. Mm -hmm. Like in the absence, I would say like, even with myself, with my son, in the absence of doing what to do, like, and I would definitely try to figure out what to do, right? A hug usually was the best response. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but I, but I do think where boys are in some ways is like, um, like in some ways it's an amazing time to be a boy. Like it's an incredible time to be, to be a boy because in some ways as society has kind of shifted, this notion of kind of a fixed path of what you have to do in some ways. Um, yeah, there's a lot more deviations that are open that used to be viewed as alternative routes, which now are just routes. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, much Carol. due to much due to work that you've been doing for decades and others have been doing in this space. Um, a quick follow up on the emotional regulation. You have a parent in front of you who has a son who's nine years old or in that age range having issues with emotional regulation. Um, what what tools does the parent have at their disposal? What would you advise? Yeah, I mean, I would say one thing in general, it's like it's very hard in the moment to perform. Right. So like in a, like the example of like the child's having a meltdown. Now you got to go do something. It's like there's pressure on everyone right there. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And the, the notion of having a very good outcome is quite poor. Right. Because the real work happens behind the scenes. Hmm. Like the real work happens in the days before and the weeks before, in the sense of just beginning to kind of have some conversations about how you might handle difficult emotions. You know, and and I think part of what we have to like, and I think this has been like, again, like an amazing shift in, you know, even as parents, I mean, I'm very lucky. I've, I've got a 20 year old and I have an eight month old. Right. And parenting has shifted in the past Ooh. 20 years. Right. It's amazing. And I'm, I think about the stuff I'm equipped with now about understanding the brain yeah. and understanding kind of how the brain works differently at different ages, which actually really changes my expectations hmm. in terms of kind of what I expect from my children. Like I know my 20 year old who is very mature and, you know, very understanding of where he wants to go. I also know he still has an adolescent brain. Mm 
and he will for many, many more years, right? So his brain is still developing. So he is going to make some mistakes. And so I want to make sure I provide, you know, good guidance when those mistakes kind of happen because they're, they're going to happen because it's normal. Like that is biological, right? It's neurological that these things are going to happen. And so I want to help him understand how to process those things when they occur. Um, but I do think what we look at again is like, you know, um, Dan Siegel talks about this, right? That, that when you work with a child, you're working on things like, like emotional regulation, get down on their level. Don't be a towering figure above, you know, kind of preaching down, but instead get down on the level, get down on your knees if you can, sit on a small chair as well, and just kind of have a conversation that's much more, more directly with them. And then in some ways begin to look at just kind of building some tools. Mm. Great advice. Okay. And so parents will have better or more in line expectations with reality if they just learn about the developmental stages. Um, and yes. we can link a resource if you have it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, the whole whole brain child is amazing for this, Dan okay. Siegel's book, but but I think also honestly, some of the things just around breathing and calming oneself that maybe you learned in a yoga class, or maybe you learned on a podcast somewhere, those can be translated down. And the reality is, is that, like I mentioned earlier, like there was a period in time where this thought, where there was a, people thought this was a great thing to teach in schools. And then that period kind of passed. And now we're at a time where we're trying to fight to get that stuff back in there. But even if it's taught in schools, right, it needs to be taught at home. Right. Social emotional learning folks. Um, let, let's shift for a moment to men. Yeah. So you're, you are doing a lot of hands-on, you're doing therapy, right? Um, in addition to your research and your professorship, um, what, what are the struggles for young men and, and other men today? And what sort of men do they want to become since that's your anchor point when you start therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and just to clarify, like, right now I'm not doing clinical work with men. Do a lot of advising and I do a fair amount of, of, of group work with men on, on the side too. And um, but I think part of what I would say is that that there's still a challenge around actually getting um, male identifying people into therapy. Yeah. And I and I and I think this notion of um, you know are men or boys going to find the help that they need. And I think for a really long time, like, it's easy to kind of blame boys and men. I kind of say, you know, my door's open. Why, why don't they come? And instead, I think there's a bit of a critique instead of kind of saying, well, but what if the services being offered aren't the ones that they want? Right. So, and, and I don't think it's just marketing, like it would that therapists have poor, poor, poor marketing, um, which they are most of the time because they don't have, don't have marketing degrees, but, um, I think there's something on understanding about like, is it possible that kind of the way we think about therapeutic work might not be the most attractive thing and why that might be right. You know, because so again, doing a bit of a, a taking stock in terms of kind of how I might might outreach to men a bit, a bit differently. Can I speak a language that might be more more effective, um, but there's always going to be a challenge around that. Right. Um, and also recognizing that it may be actually um paraprofessional folks who who do really good work initially you know a lot of men have, you know find themselves into aa right you know and that's a paraprofessional kind of space but it clicks a lot of boxes for a lot of men around the anonymous component which reduces stigma right it also and again i'm not necessarily a, a proponent here and therefore aa but i'm aware of the things that it does right that it provides universality and it provide it provides community and there's ways in which I think that is really helpful for men. Um, I think some of the things that men experience in boys too is that, is that how do we communicate to this population that they matter? Mm. Oh, and what I mean by that is like, there's absolutely elements around kind of male power and privilege and you know larger egos that a lot of men who are powerful, right? Think they matter, maybe a little too much, right? Um, but there's another kind of piece around kind of society, which I think a lot of men believe in a sense that they're, they're disposable. Like they, they're, they're 
value is extended to kind of the ability to provide or the ability to kind of be successful. And then when they have pain and suffering, that essentially kind of reduces their mattering, right? And so they go inward on that. So I'm not gonna show you that though, right? Because if I show it to you, then I'm now experiencing um, much larger shame than I'm already experiencing internally, right? So I don't wanna share that with you. But I think that actually is a bit around the roots of kind of self-harm and suicide as well. Mm -hmm is that there's a way in which kind of, and this is actually a core theory of, of actually suicide ideation, which is called call, call the suicide script theory, which is that there's scripts throughout history that look at the way that, that men view their bodies at, as, as disposable, whether it's through war or even through stress of sport, you know, that, that, and then when that body doesn't have any use anymore, then there's no value attached either. So there's ways in which we begin to kind of talk about that you matter. I think that's particularly helpful, helpful for men of color. I think it's really useful for people who have intersecting identities that are marginalized and also identify as male in the sense that like they matter with as who they are. And I think again, as helpers, like, and, how, and I view helpers very broadly, just so you know, a teacher is a helper, a nurse is a helper, right? It just, you don't have to be a licensed person to be a helper. Um, but I think when you, even in, in a K-12 setting, if the boy feels like he matters in school, he'll probably go to school. And when he feels like he doesn't matter, he won't, right? And he won't engage in that kind of sense. I think that's critical. But so again, there's an element around also letting men know that their pain is real. Mm. You know, because, you know, men do engage in lots of denial. Um, around that, there's a denial of pain. Um, and so part of that comes to this notion that like you're experiencing pain and you're not alone in experiencing it. There are other people who experience this as well. And I think for a lot of men, like loss is an example of that. Like men experience a lot of losses, humans experience a lot of losses. We know, however, that, that men compared to women tend to have much greater psychological kind of impact of losses. Right. Part of it is because a lot of men don't have communities in which to process that loss. So, so they're sitting it with them kind of selves and they're, and they're essentially kind of suffering in silence. Mm, mm, thank you. Um, one last question before we hop into questions from the audience. And that question is, what advice would you give to your younger self if he were standing in front of you? And I know you have this really unusual upbringing, right, where you maybe were able to see the social construction of gender and masculinities because you went from kind of a hippie upbringing in Hawaii mostly yeah. to half the swing states uh, more, more kind of traditional. Um, yeah. What advice would you give your younger self, Dr. Matt? It, it's funny you mentioned the hippie, hippie upbringing and I think that's true. And I think when this, when I moved to Hawaii, my parents put me in a very hippie school. I think that fit the way they thought that you know their life should be. And then they went and visited the school a few months in and they were shocked by how, how crazy it was. And I immediately got put into like a very rigid, very rigid independent school system. <laughs> um, um, but I, that's Too funny. Too far. Too yeah. far, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I was thinking about that question, you know, and, and I would say like, like, like one part of me kind of says, what I would tell my younger self is that, you know, when you ask your dad whether or not you should take, take that school, counseling job for 48K, or you should take the startup for minimum wage and stock options. Don't listen to your dad, take the stock options. But um, um, but I think in some ways, like, I think what I would, and I, and I say this meaning, I feel like I had a very good childhood and I feel very fortunate based on the life that I have, um, having adults that cared about me and having kind of coaches and teachers who cared about me. Um, and so I feel very fortunate around that. Um, I think that one of the things I would tell my younger self is to do hard things. Mm -hmm. Do hard things and fail and be unsuccessful, but mm -hmm. just learn how to do hard things. You know, and I think there's something about that that builds just kind of grit and, um, and to carry that throughout your life. I think I would tell myself that the kind of transparency and honesty have, have rewards. Um, mainly the authentic you, because you'll also 
um, attract people who, who also are honest and, and authentic. And those are growth oriented people. Um, I think part of it I would tell myself too, and this comes from experiencing lots of loss of, of my parents and my family members and in particular is that um, I think I would, I would tell myself that as much as like I cared about my parents to also care for them more. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that like, I think my dad was very lonely in his life. Um, and I, I wish I could have been like, I was actually very close to him and, but I saw, I see that now. And I, I think now I can see some of the, you know, failings of my parents and wish I could have stepped in more to help, you know, mm. you know, and I think the last thing I would say is that I think that, you know, I tell myself that the relationships with friends and family will bring you the most joy in your life. You know, and not only will that, it will also allow you to live longer <laughs> and healthier. We have the data. Yes, we have the data. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, let's jump in here to some questions. Charles is asking Dr. Matt, although I think masculinity has some universal themes, I'm curious about how you broach the topic with clients about culture and how masculinity varies across cultures. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that there's, um, you know, again, like I think that's I said earlier, it's like that's the difference between between masculinity with a Y and masculinity with an IES, right? So there is what we would call dominant masculinity. You might might call it hegemonic masculinity if you're a sociologist. I, you know, I typically wouldn't use that word even when I did study sociology. But, um, but I, and I would say around that is that most people in Western societies, and particularly most men, right, um, understand what dominant masculinity means. Right. So this is kind of be tough, be aggressive, be stoic, be independent, be on your own. Don't cry. And, and I literally think we know it because it was pummeled into you. And I literally mean it was pummeled into me. That's how I learned these things. Right. Um, now, I don't identify necessarily as a traditional man. Like I like I in many ways, I understand what that means. And different times I've been aware when I violated those norms and and violating those spaces when I was younger had much more ramifications than now, now at 53, right? Um, but I'm aware that, that there's deviation, I, my core self, you know, and from that is also recognizing that men themselves are not, not monoliths, right? There's always good deviation. There's always gonna, going to be alternative stories and narratives. And I think race, class and gender and power and ability or all these intersecting factors that impact who we are. So I know, for example, that the masculinity I grew up in, the identity I have as someone who kind of primarily grew up in a, in a, in a rural kind of working class, white, white dominated kind of town in, in Wisconsin, as a white man, as a different experience than from, from a Latino immigrant in, in, in the Central Valley in California. So there may be some themes that are similar, but our life experiences are different and the way society treats us is different. So as a clinician, you know, it's, an, it's in a way, it's my job to have a better understanding in terms of kind of how he understands his masculinity and how he's come to that. Mm -hmm. I'm also very aware that this question of kind of like what masculinity means to you, or what masculinity means to you is typically an academic question and that men don't walk around asking that question and unless you were in a in a men's group at some point or a gender studies class you probably never answered that question directly right and so again masculinity is often done to us it's often around us but we don't always sit down and have these reflective moments and so as a clinician i'm going to work with you and kind of understand like help me understand kind of how you've come to understanding what it means to be a man how have you learned that? Are there moments or experiences that stand out, right? And then often what I hear about are experiences with one's kind of family members, and really father, grandfather, uncles, um, and, and like brothers, I hear a lot of experiences about kind of coming of age, right? And then the intersection in terms of how things like religion might impact also masculinity, right? Or how kind of race might do it. And, and in doing so, like what you realize that everyone truly does have their own unique 
identity and we're not monoliths. Yeah, thank you. Great response. Um, Kai is asking so a few great questions. Maybe they go together. Um, are you teaching deconditioning nervous system regulation skills in humane cooperation versus competition? And then she goes further into what deconditioning is, right? Deconditioning away from sexism, racism, and ableism will allow men and boys to see that sentimentality toward great and tough capitalist men is neither deserved nor appropriate. Um, that is an awesome question, and I don't know if I would necessarily put it in those kinds of terms on that way, but I do think what you're talking about is, is a deconstruction of power and a deconstruction of powerful narratives that, to me, actually only lead to disconnection, right? The, the, these, are, these are disconnecting narratives which kind of fit in this notion that kind of masculinity, you know, um, there's a theory of masculinity called... Um, precarious mas masculinity, and it's a notion that essentially masculine identity is hard fought and, and easily lost. You fight, fight, fight to be the powerful person, to show other people that you're whatever it is. And the moment you get on top, you're just waiting to be knocked down. That is competition. That is capitalism. That is always realizing that you're not enough, right? And for men, those falling down leads to isolation. So I, I think that if you don't deconstruct power, right, then it's very difficult for men to have authentic relationships with other men and other people in their life. Um, so I, I do think when I work with kind of, you know, I do some work in K-12 settings on authenticity and having conversations about kind of what that inner you, like with the what's emanating out of you, right, not what's being kind of put in you from the outside, right? And as you, and can you, again, at a very difficult time in your life, if you think about adolescence, can, is there a way in which that inner you also has space, right? And has space to come out and, and kind of flourish because again, there's all these forces on the outside that will tell you you're not enough. Mm. That's great. Okay, so looking at it, a lot of what you're offering, I'm finding is very pragmatic, right? It's very, uh, it, it's something that will resonate with boys and men because of your because you have actually taken this body of knowledge and applied it in a clinical setting. Um, so being able to meet them where they are and using the language that they're using, but accomplishing the same, you know, yeah. same yeah. goal. Yeah, um, yeah. I would say around that, right, yeah, Caroline. You're like, and I, and I work in a very self self justice oriented counseling program, and we talk a lot about about power and how that kind of plays out, and and. I also am aware that some of the things that happen, the conversations that happen in academic settings, right, are are very different from the conversations that happen in a parking lot, or that that happen in the. And so, how do we translate these ideas that are complex, and have meaning and and value, in a way that they can be gobbled up, so to speak, right? Like in a very very simple kind of way, also at a developmental level. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, Shira comments, thank you so much for your expertise and especially for frank conversation about suicidality and men and mas masculinity. Your points about masculinity and the internalized sense of disposable bodies is so important. Um, Love uh, has a question that dovetails with this. As a young person, I've experienced working with many women, girls, and femme presenting people on deconstructing gender norms, but not nearly as much men or boys. How would you recommend going about reaching out to them, especially when speaking on these issues is considered a taboo for many men and boys? Yeah, I think that the, but both those questions do go together, actually, um, because I, I, um, I think some of the things I, I talk about, like um, what I'm talking about today too, like a lot of these are aha moments for me too. Like over the past year, the past two years, like I'm still learning so much about this from colleagues and um, friends and boys, right? Who tell me things. And, and, and I think that the thing I would kind of share about that is um, as much as society is shifting and changing, and it is, Right. We still know that that male power is real. We know the patriarchy is real and it has and part of what patriarchy does. Right. We talk about about oppression is is it it obviously 
gives power to some people, right? But also powerful people also experience oppression from that oppression itself, right? In the sense that, that we know that with men, like the things that you're supposed to do to make you powerful is also what's going to kill you. And I mean, literally, that is what is going to kill you and why the mortality rate for men in Western countries is at least five years lower than, than, than women. It's not biological. It's, it's sociological, it's psychological, and it's essentially behaviors, right? And again, the things that we're taught to do leads to isolation. And it leads to us actually not having social support, not taking care of ourselves and having disposable bodies. And I think when, with patriarchy in particular and with things like suicide, part of patriarchy does is it deconditions us and tells us to not ask how you, men are doing. Yeah. We don't ask how he's doing, why? We don't want to emasculate him. We don't want him to feel weak. We don't want to embarrass him. We don't want to shame him, right? And so we just don't ask the questions. And the flip side of that now is that, you know, again, this is one of these like aha awarenesses moment. That, like I'm more and more and more when I talk to, to men is what I'm aware is that I think actually suicidal ideation is a normative state for men. Mm. I, I truly do. And, de and that, that does not mean that all men are going to die by suicide, or, but I think that the idea of being disposable and the idea that when you experience distress or a setback or pain, that suicide comes into your recognition and your cognition is normative for men. And I think if you ask them, they're not gonna be like, oh, I haven't thought about that. A lot of men in a chilling way, as a matter of fact, will say yes. Right. And and it, it doesn't mean you have to immediately pick up 911 and call emergency services because he may not actually actually be in a place where he's going to harm himself. But the idea that he's thinking about it is pretty normative. And, it, and if you have that conversation, then you can also express the fact, the counter narrative, which is why I love you. You know, gosh, that would be, I would miss you so much. I would hurt, like, because in his head, what he's, he's not often thinking that. He's thinking, I won't be missed. Mm. You're, you're like, you know, and, and I think there's a way, and, and I, this is not easy, so I'm not saying like, you know, but there's a way in which kind of being able to stay with, with in a very tough space and have these conversations with men about this is really powerful. I think, I think Movember, has done an incredible job of this, of kind of looking at how you would have a conversation around this as someone who doesn't have any psychological training, but they have kind of breakdowns in terms of kind of how to talk to a friend and what you kind of do, because the reality is, is that a friend is probably the person who's going to find out first, mm -hmm. or at least have the inkling, right? So I've come to the point where I'm not afraid to talk to people about this. Um, I've talked down two of my closest friends at different points in their life in which I realized if I didn't pick up the, the call and be very blunt with them, I don't know if they would be alive today. Mm -hmm. and, and, the re and I say this because the reality is, is that if, you, if we know that roughly 80% of completed suicides, of, of death by suicides are male, that if we think about people we know who've died by suicide in our life, it's probably men and boys. And a lot of men and boys then means that they've had exposure to their friends and their family who've died by suicide. And, and so I think that, again, there's a contagion in that as well, in which that normative kind of thing gets reinforced. I know it's a really serious topic, and I'm, but I think if we don't start talking about it in a serious way, then it's just going to continue. And, and I think sometimes I say to people, do you realize it was 80%? And they said, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Some will say, oh, I knew that. And my response has always been, then why don't we care? That's an epidemic. It is an epidemic. And that's yeah. the suicide, death by suicide. But then there are all these slow deaths, right? There's the high yeah. risk behaviors, the addiction, that yeah. data, which is lopsided for men as well. It's the slow suicide that you're, yeah. when you're talking about suicidal ideation being a normative state and the interplay between disposable bodies and high risk behaviors and not seeking help. And I mean, it's just, yes, a conversation we need to have. Um, Charles asks, 
tell it, you know, about the mental app, right? It's M-E-N-T-A-L app. Yes. Um, what can you report from the mental app? How does it intervene and, and what do we know so far? Yeah, thank you. And, and this isn't meant to be a promo for it, but um, but I would say is that the mental is from the creators of Calm. So you've heard mm -hmm. of the Calm app. Two of the founders of kind of Calm left to create mental. Um, not surprising, the CEO's story of why is because the two men in his life he loved the most died by suicide. And he realizes that yeah. things like Calm do not attract male audiences. Um, so how do you do something different? And I think what I would say around that is for the most part, mental is aimed at people who probably aren't going to therapy. Mm -hmm. So it, so, and I like to say, let's not therapy, but it can certainly be th therapeutic. Um, that the, what I like about the mental app A is that it's, um, you know, it's pro-feminist without saying it, it's pro-feminist, um, but it doesn't take shots at anybody. It meets you where you are, it's inclusive, and it's very positive growth oriented, right? So it's about kind of how do you become a better you? You know, because one of the things that I was thinking about is like advice I have for kind of working with men sometimes is like, you actually just have to get, you have to do something. And so we think about like, uh, where men get stuck, they get stuck in, in, in a place where they don't move. And, you know, as we know, a, a body at rest remains at rest, a body in motion remains in motion. Our job as therapists, clinicians, helpers is to get people moving, right? So I don't think you can push up yourself out of depression, okay? But I think if you start doing a bunch of push-ups, you begin to gain some self-esteem, you begin to gain some kind of care about your body, it gives you something to do, and then you begin to kind of do other types of things. So the, the way the app works, it has a lot of activities that are gear, that are around kind of building skills like emotional regulation skills. So I'm just real quick, like there's a cold shower protocol. The cold shower has a coach. It's a Navy SEAL. He did the Navy mm -hmm. a Warrior Toughness Program, which is evidence-based, psychological based. It's not yelling at people. But the notion is that in a cold shower, could you learn emotional regulation skills? So as opposed to kind of screaming how cold it is, right, which is how I started taking the cold shower, instead, I learned how to regulate my breath. So when cold water hits, I'm regulating my breath, I'm learning how to handle things. And what I've seen from the mental app is a lot of people I know who've used it have kind of found that throughout their lives, how to deal with de-escalation of kind of anger or stress and moments. One of my really good friends has done it with his children, his boys who are, who are in sixth and eighth grade. And yes, there's some swearing in it, but he's less concerned about the swearing and more focused on the fact that they're going to learn some emotional regulation and they've already applying it to soccer. Right. And talk about it. Right. And he says, and my boys take showers. Like they're excited about, about Navy SEAL training. And so they do that and they take showers every day. But I think what I've learned is that there's a lot of men out there who are in incredible pain, yeah. who are not seeking help. And actually some of the, the testimonials are heartbreaking. And, and they're looking for some guidance around it. And, and yes, we have a certain segment that has the door open. It says, come get psychological help. It is not where men are going. Some men are, but it's not hitting the population that might, might need it the most. And we actually call that double jeopardy, the notion that men who need the most help are probably those who are least likely to seek it. Mm -hmm. Well. I am sorry to report we're out of time because we have a number of great questions. Alex, uh, Debshi, Kai, please reach out to uh, to Matt directly and Dr. Engler Carlson. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. This has been just an incredible conversation. Um, just end by telling us where we can find your materials and follow you and support you. Um, thanks so much. I mean, I think the best way to find me is probably at my academic site, um, which is Cal State Fullerton Counseling Department. That's usually the best place to find me. Um, I'm on Instagram also, Dr. Um, M-A-T-T-E-C. That's fine too. I just do professional things there as well. Um, but I think, honestly, you can reach out to me directly. I'm accessible. I'm happy to talk to people. Um, and particularly if we're all in it and in the sense that we're looking for a better world for, for boys. Amen. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, and have a wonderful afternoon. Please reach out to Dr. Engler Carlson directly. You heard it. He'll respond. Uh, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.